I would like to begin by calling this evening's event to order. Once again, thank you all for joining us tonight. My name is Tony. I'm an assistant dean in Hofstra University School of Health Professions and Human Services. And this evening's event is the eighth installment of the State of Hope Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange event series in Hofstra University's School of Health Professions and Human Services. Beginning us this evening will be the Dean of our school, Dr. Holly Syrup. Dean Syrup has 35 plus years of experience serving as a fixture of leadership on Hofstra University's campus. Throughout her career, Dean Syrup has held past roles, including Executive Dean of Students, Vice President for Campus Life. She then transitioned to becoming a full-time faculty member and achieved the rank of full professor for the joint, uh, joint professorship in the departments of education leadership and counseling and mental health professions. In 2015, she rejoined administrative leadership on campus and became the vice dean of the School of Health Professions and Human Services, and then became the dean of our school. Under Dean Syrup's tenure, the School of Health Professions and Human Services has seen tremendous growth. Our enrollment has grown substantially, as well as the number of academic programs that we have and will continue to offer. The School of Health Professions and Human Services is now the second largest in graduate education on Hofstra's campus. And most recently, in October 2019, Dean Syrup was named one of the top 50 women in business for the Long Island Business News. And it's my absolute pleasure to now ask Dean Holly Syrup to unmute herself and begin our event this evening. Thank you, Dean Syrup. Thank you, Tony, and, and good afternoon, everyone. And, and thank you for joining us for the eighth State of Hope virtual event. The State of Hope, as Tony said, Healthcare Opportunities and Policy Exchange was created to provide an outlet for the community to come together to discuss contemporary issues in healthcare and the impact they have on current and future policy. And today's program will be exploring America's Help Online, the emergence and growth of virtual care. And there is no doubt that COVID-19 has impacted our physical and mental health, changed how we go about our daily lives, and challenged our community and healthcare infrastructure. One of the many changes to healthcare is the exponential increase in the use of telehealth. Even today, as we're seeing COVID cases and hospitalizations decrease and vaccines roll out, we need to remain vigilant in maintaining the public health guidance required regarding physical distancing, hand washing, and wearing masks. And although there seems to be a light at the end of the tunnel, and we will emerge from the pandemic having learned much about our preparation, response, and the overall infrastructure of our healthcare system. Changes needed to be made out of necessity to continue to provide services. The question now is, will some of these changes be permanent, impacting our healthcare deliver delivery well into the future? One example of a change is the use of telehealth. Once considered a far too futuristic type of care, practices of hospitals, health systems, and mental health providers adapted by increasing their use of telehealth practices on a large scale in response to the pandemic. This has brought to the forefront, once again, the discussion regarding future policies surrounding telehealth practices, insurance coverage, and Medicare Medicaid reimbursement. In addition, while the increase in telehealth services has served many patients and clients well during the COVID-19 pandemic, it brings to light disparities. Should the future hold more large-scale telehealth use, use, what does that mean for seniors who may not have large mobile phone data plans and may not have access to high-speed internet? Same is true with working class or rural communities whose residents, once again, may not have access to high-speed internet. With that in mind, I am so looking forward to hearing the discussion today and would like to thank our speakers who have been so generous to share their expertise, insight, and time. And now it's my honor to introduce our moderator, Camp Hannon, Health Policy Fellow in the School of Health Professions and Human Services. 
Kemp joined HPHS in April 2019 after a distinguished career in the New York State Senate, where he built a reputation for working across party lines to put the health and well being of others in the forefront. He continues to do so by organizing and facilitating our state of hope programs, which allows for the exchange of thought, policy, and practice. It is now my distinct pleasure to turn the program over to Ken. Thank you very much, D Dean Sarah. Appreciate everybody joining with us today and our distinguished speakers. Thank you for taking the time. It was probably 2014 that I uh, ended a negotiation with the executive branch and we had achieved getting telehealth put into uh, a covered service in Medicaid. That, however, um, really had fell, uh, went no place fast as uh, the federal government wouldn't approve it. And yet we, because we had made the agreement with uh, the then health secretary to the governor, uh, different administration, um, the, um, the, the state uh, said, we'll, we'll cover it. But uh, rolling forward a couple of more years, the uh, chair of the Rural uh, Senate Committee on Health uh, not, uh, had en enrolled me to go to some hearings on telehealth. And we discovered that hardly any billing was being done in New York State. As a result of those hearings, we tried to promote rural telehealth because the amount of uh, health in the rural parts of the state was sorely lacking, especially psychiatric and especially pediatric psychiatric. But all of that uh, left practitioners such as Dr. Dorfler and, and uh, Northwell uh, starting to work building block by building block in regard to telehealth. Um, and I know they were doing great building blocks because I visited what I call his laboratory uh, in Syosset and he showed me uh, all of the different aspects of telehealth that Northwell was, was involving into. So I'm delighted that our lead speaker today will be Dr. Martin Dorfler, who was uh, heading up Northwell's uh, extensive, now extensive, um, uh, telehealth in initiative. On the heels of Dr. Dorfler's presentation, uh, Jeffrey Friedman's agreed to uh, talk to us about what I had not realized to be as an extensive uh, practice in regard to telehealth for substance abuse and mental health, which like uh, the physical health had boomed during the pandemic. I think that in, in and of itself is a fascinating story. Now, the building blocks of all of this come about because of the extensive laws that already existed, the extensive laws that were waived partially and wholly uh, during the pandemic. And uh, attorneys Joanne Bergman and Wendy Wasserman um, from the council's office in Northwell uh, will help guide us through uh, the intricacies. And just as people know that the intricate part of regular uh, medical practice is all there with, with billing codes and, and uh, privacy rules and uh, credentialing and surveillance. Um, you can imagine the types of things that are uh, being waived right now in telehealth and might not be waived in the future. So this is an interesting adventure. Um, I think I'm fascinated as, as a health fellow, uh, the chance to explore some of the current uh, things that are taking place and uh, where we might be going uh, is a great deal of fun. So Dr. Dorfler, if you'd be so kind to lead us off. Uh, Dr. Dorfler is a um, fully credentialed physician. Um, um, I, I do have your bio here. I should have me memorized it. Um, the uh, University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, NYU for your internal medicine, critical care medicine at the National Institute of Health further the critical care fellowship and medical ICUs at New York Medical College. So with, and I know over a decade of uh, great work at, at Northwell. So thanks for joining Dr. Dorflet. the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Kim, for inviting me um, uh, and uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so there's a lot of issues here and, and, and you know, I think that um, just leading this off where well, we've got uh, 45 minutes for all of us to tell you a history of of 50 years plus uh, all the regulatory elements that fit into there and the COVID story and the like, we could probably spend uh, an entire day on this. Um, but just real quick, you know, telehealth is, is decades old. 
Um, it has largely been under a banner similar to what uh, uh, Kemp was just talking about of rural underserved areas uh, where a significant um, specialists were not available. Some of the regulatory things that Wendy and Joanna will talk about a little later on come out of that. Um, but there's another really important piece of this when we look at the COVID experience, which is a bit of, you know, where's the chicken and where's the egg here? Um, because we, we, we had COVID kick us up to a dramatic change in the utilization of telehealth. Um, but some of the things that impeded that prior to COVID uh, really were things that had COVID not occurred and those impediments had been dropped like some of the regulatory issues, uh, some of the technology advances, telehealth would be far uh, more advanced pre-COVID than it ended up being. Um, Kim talks a little bit about the uh, telehealth operation at Northwell, uh, we refer to as our clinical operations room, uh, which is really specifically telehealth programs that have been focused on our inpatient areas. Um, and so why do telehealth for inpatient areas? Well, just as with anything else, there, there are real opportunities. Um, we have an emergency telepsychiatry program been in place for a number of years that dramatically shortens the amount of time someone waits in the emergency department to be seen by a psychiatrist um, to determine whether they can go home or whether they need to be admitted to a hospital. And you know, sometimes you're sitting there for, for half a day or more under those circumstances, that's important. We have a telestroke program. Uh, to bring the strip neurologist to the emergency department in minutes, as opposed to get in their car, drive in in the middle of the night, uh, an hour, hour and a half may be a big difference in how much brain injury one, uh, one sustains. We have a tele-ICU program, similar types of things, where you're taking time out of the equation, accelerating the uh, addressing an acute problem and improving the quality of care. Uh, and importantly to recognize pre-COVID, the vast majority of these things were not paid for. Um, the professional billing for these type of services because we're not in rural underserved areas where regulation did allow some of the things that Kemp was just talking about hadn't really caught up with these utilizations. And so the business case for them, Northwell, as, as most of the, in fact, I think all of the um, uh, healthcare providers in New York State, I don't think we actually have for-profit uh, hospitals in, in New York, Kemp, you can correct me on that. Yep. Um, so all of the hospitals in New York are not for profit and we're doing these things to serve our communities. and. We lose money in one place, we make money on another place, and telehealth, uh, for the pre-COVID at least, was one of the places where we lost money, um, but we provide services necessary to, to serve our communities. We had started um, in Northwell working on a journey into ambulatory telehealth um, several years before, and we were, we were dipping our toes in, and we were really trying to determine where it would work and how it would work, uh, and importantly, looking at places where that did not um, uh, in any way that we could determine early on. And, and how do you test things when you, when you don't have a good laboratory like some of the inpatient things, but you know, we need to start it off where it's, it's going to fit into the care paradigm. Uh, even though it's not going to be paid for, we can find ways to make it work. So we have a house calls program um, for homebound elderly, which is on a PM, PM per, month, per member per month structure. And so we could do things there. Um, we have some certain things under grants uh, we had literally just started moving into the regular use of telehealth within some of our pioneering practices, relatively limited. The other thing I think it's important to put here in terms of what had all happened pre-COVID, uh, my journey into telehealth as part of my career is actually 20 years old. Um, and when I first started in the space, which was in the inter-hospital space in the critical care arena, as Kent mentioned, that is my clinical background. Um, you know, the technology was far from ready and the technology to do the kind of things that everyone saw during COVID uh, was really a, a decade and a half away. Um, over the last five years, the change in, in smartphones and tablets, the better av availability of bandwidth when we were dealing with, you know, we're all talking about 5G. I remember being really, really excited about 2G uh, coming. <laughs> you know, the, the bandwidth in your cell phone, right? Or the, the, the memory in your cell phone right now exceeds what was in our computers when we started some of these things years ago. And so the technological revolution of the last couple of years has also been dramatic. The standards are being created so that there's a level of software interoperability between different telehealth tools is all over the last couple of years. And so when COVID hit, uh, to some degree, the crisis was uh, perfect timing from a standpoint of telehealth because there were things in the wings that we could put into place. Now they weren't in place. Um, March 1st of last year, I had uh, within Northwell, 
uh, and Joanne and Wendy know this well, they worked with us for a couple of years on developing all of our policies and procedures and, 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 and things internally. So we were ready for, for this, uh, which was incredibly fortunate because we didn't have to just start from scratch. We started from a very immature stage, but we started with something. Um, but when it first hit, we were doing 150 direct-to-consumer telehealth visits per month, for months on end, for the last six or seven months. And, and we accelerated that, and that was probably 30 or 40 physicians. By the end of May, we had 8,000 clinicians, not just our physicians. We had home care, we had our nutritionists, we had nurse practitioners, we had our behavioral health teams across the board. Um, anybody you could, you could imagine who needed to be involved in the care of a patient had access to virtual tools. Um, but at the same time that many of you were looking for laptops and webcams and, and earbuds like the ones I have in, in, you know, in my ears right now, uh, we bought them by the thousands. Um, we pushed out 5,000 uh, webcams to our, our physicians in literally six weeks. Uh, we pushed out 10,000 sets of earbuds. Um, we loaded on you know, 800 physicians to have access to the system uh, every week for a number of weeks, starting off with the people who were taking primary care, internal medicine, pediatrics, obstetrics, and then going to those taking care of patients most at risk, our pulmonologists, obviously for COVID, but oncologists and transplant physicians and others, and then slowly progressed that whole group and, over the, and got everybody on by the end of June. And then over the last couple of months, we've been working to move everybody into a more integrated environment to really create a virtual office experience so that their online scheduling and patients in a virtual waiting room and they can be met in there by the office staff. And when the physician says, I want a follow-up visit, somebody comes in and helps them schedule that. The evolution of this over the past year has been truly extraordinary. Um, and with that, an important piece coming back to the mission of us. And, and again, the other, you know, this is not just a Northwell story. I'm here to tell it and I'm very happy to be here telling our story, but the same story, you know, played out in an awful lot of the organizations around the state and elsewhere in the country. It allowed us to provide care that was necessary for our communities so that people could be safe in their homes, not have to get onto public transportation unnecessarily, uh, if that was the case, um, could, could see their doctors uh, around COVID and non-COVID, a patient with high blood pressure who hasn't been seeing, somebody who's got back pain and they're started on new medications. Any of patient had surgery three months ago and he's supposed to follow up and see what's going on. All of these things came to bear in there. Let me stop there because there's a whole lot of things in, in this story. And I know that you know, one of the most important parts of this story has been the behavioral health piece. Huge amount of what's happening happened over the last year. And it was ripe for this because behavioral health is one of those areas in the whole healthcare domain where you do not need to touch a patient virtually ever. Um, because some argue, argue that touching a patient in behavioral health circumstance other than giving a good hug when they truly need it. Is, is not a part of, of, of that paradigm. Well, I'll let Jeff go on that a little bit better, but it was ripe for this and a huge fraction of the telehealth care that has occurred during COVID. And certainly I believe one of the things that's going to be sustained in the long run, um, although I think everything, everything's going to have some degree of sustainment in the long run, but as a really predominant element of it is behavioral health. So with that Kemp, let me pass back to you unless you have something specific you want me to address that I didn't and let you pass this on to, uh, to Jeffrey. Well, I have, I have lots of questions, but let, let us uh, turn to Jeffrey at the moment. Uh, Jeffrey is the CEO of the Central Nassau Counseling uh, Agency, which is based in Hicksville. And uh, he, I, I was looking to see how many he employs, but there's a lot, a lot of people because his mission is twofold. And I don't even understand how you um, harmonize those two missions, one in regard to mental health and the second in regard to substance abuse, both of which are huge problems in Long Island and in our state. Um, Jeffrey has re gained renown as a good strategist in addressing uh, these problems, uh, a good manager of a vast staff, and uh, I'm glad he's able to join us today. Jeffrey, maybe you can tell us uh, the sto your story as, as to telehealth and COVID. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Kemp, for having uh, me here today and to tell the story of uh, CN Guidance and Counseling Services. Uh, CN Guidance and Counseling Services has been around for over uh, nearly 50 years. Uh, we have uh, served 7,000 Long Islanders a year, um, and we have a staff of 370 people. Um, our services include anywhere from residential, where people need 
24 hour, seven day a week care where staff live in the homes to uh, residential settings where people have their own apartments and we visit those apartments um, on a weekly or a monthly basis to see how they're doing. Uh, we're a nonprofit organization that really improves the lives of people who are um, suffering from mental health and substance abuse disorders. And that is our focus, our main focus. Um, CN Guidance and Counseling was one of the first certified community behavioral health clinics here on Long Island. That's a designation from New York State uh, that allows us to do some pretty amazing things in our mental health and substance abuse clinic. First of all, uh, that clinic is, uh, um, has an integrated license. So that integrated license allows us to, if somebody comes through the door and they have a substance abuse problem, we can both assess them for their substance abuse problem and their mental health problem. Many of the folks that we treat have uh, both uh, disorders. So we're able to assess them and then provide the proper care for that. The clinic uh, also allows us to see people same day. So people don't have to wait in terms of to get into the clinic. They can come right in that day and we're able to see them. The clinic allows for 24 hour, seven day a week a mobile crisis if people are experiencing crisis. And if people don't show up to appointments, we can find out and follow up of where they've been. So we have a, a whole uh, uh, wraparound services for folks who have mental health and substance abuse uh, you know, issues that we can uh, you know, provide for them. Um, the story I'm gonna tell you today is about what happened to us uh, Monday, March 13th, 2020. Um, that was the first day for us that uh, we made the decision as an organization uh, that we would have to go virtual. So pre-pandemic, uh, basically we were doing about 1% of all of our uh, visits uh, virtually, 1%. Um, by uh, the end of April, 96% of all the visits that we had uh, were virtual. So we ramped up very, very quickly. And um, so some of the things that were mentioned already, the reason why we were able to do that is because some of those regulations were relaxed and um, we were able to kind of put forth, um, you know, a comprehensive plan of how we were gonna do that. And staff were really nervous in terms of how this was going to work and what this was going to look like. And, um, you know, we were, we had a lot of things in place, but there were a lot of things that we were not prepared for in terms of kind of laying out some of the things that, that were happening. So for us to be able to do this, you know, uh, a lot of regulations were relaxed. And so pre-pandemic uh, uh, reimbursement, uh, you know, uh, co-pays now were, were not the responsibility of the patient anymore. Uh, you know, the, the, uh, the insurance companies were, were, were paying those. Uh, location, you know, pre-pandemic, you had to go to specific locations in a specific hub to be able to do telehealth. Now with the relaxed res regulations, you can do them anywhere. Um, and technology, um, the technology that you had to employ to do telehealth was very expensive. There was specific technology that you had to employ. But the equipment that we can use now are things like, you know, uh, FaceTime and Skype and Google and, and things like that. Um, that we make sure that, that, that are, um, you know, HIPAA compliant. Um, they also change some of the regulations in terms of, uh, you know, the amount of time that you can see somebody to bill. So a visit used to be between 15 and 30 minutes. Now visits are between five and 15 minutes. You know, we used to have to get a, original signatures required on documentation. Now we're allowed verbal consent. Um, you know, pre-pandemic, only licensed providers were allowed to provide services. But what we found during the pandemic when they relaxed these regulations is how important peer services are. When someone has life experience that they can engage an individual who has mental health and substance abuse issues, we have seen that those outcomes, those health outcomes are much better. And the modality used to be just video, but right now it's video and audio. So these changes allowed us to kind of transition for our staff to make, uh, uh, you know, to a, a virtual environment. Um, we had to, you know, assess for our staff, their in-home equipment and their con connectivity needs and do that. We had to teach them how to work remotely. 
many folks did not know the technology and we had to work with them on that. Uh, we had to get our, our, our patients uh, for them to learn the technology and be able to do that. We also, you know, we're a nonprofit, so we don't have a, a lot of disposable income. And, you know, for the 300 some odd staff to be able to purchase laptops and purchase, you know, equipment to be able to do this, cameras and et cetera, we didn't have the funding. Uh, so we applied for federal funds and was able to get a very big grant for technology to be able to purchase these things. And uh, we were able to do that really quick. We needed to create new policies and procedures to ensure that we were following these regulations. Um, and we need to monitor the data very closely uh, because we wanted to see what we were doing, whether, whether it was having an impact in terms of health outcomes. And what we saw was uh, the big advantages of telehealth were better access. People were missing less appointments. It was more convenient for them. Um, and you know what, the, the, the percentage of, of, of patients that we saw who were millennials really embraced this uh, you know, new way of providing services. But we did see some disadvantages in terms of how people were accessing uh, you know, the telehealth. Um, some folks didn't have access to it or couldn't get access to it. And we had to work with them in terms of figuring that out by providing equipment, et cetera, or, or broadband so they could, they could participate. Not every of our patients wanted to do it. And then we had to make accommodations for those folks to come into the office and how we were gonna do that. Uh, we also found that people didn't want to participate in groups. Groups is a very, very big modality in how we treat people and group attendance really plummeted. And we needed to figure out how to do that. Uh, and we saw that people were really experiencing Zoom fatigue like many of us um, and how to kind of motivate people to kind of engage in treatment. Um, what's interesting is that, you know, how quickly everything moved, you know, that day in March all of a sudden, a drop of a hat, we're providing services very, very differently. And obviously, uh, if this pandemic, the silver lining of this pandemic, uh, one of the few is that we were able to kind of plunge into this and be able to show that we can provide these services virtually, which was really important. So uh, Seema Verman, uh, a former CMS uh, Centers for uh, Medicaid and uh, uh, Medicare Services, had a, a really good quote. Now that providers and patients have gotten a taste, it's really difficult to imagine, imagine the telehealth genie going back in the bottle. And we've made so much progress so fast that um, they're, they're, you know, access to care has really exploded in terms of doing that. Um, the governor uh, this month unveiled uh, uh, some uh, you know, uh, uh, legislation that he wants to get passed in terms of keeping some of these relaxed regulations and making them permanent, you know, to, uh, you know, for unlocking, uh, you know, the benefits of telehealth uh, around reimbursement uh, and coverage and uh, keeping this momentum going so we can, you know, really serve the, the, the folks that we do in a way that, that you know, we're, we're getting to everybody uh, in, in these times. So, um, you know, CN Guidance has seen this uh, and has made a lot of progress um, and is excited to see what the future holds in terms of how we can provide a hybrid model, both uh, virtually and in person. I think it's going to be uh, really exciting to, to see those health outcomes really uh, improve by doing both once this pandemic ends. So, thank you. Thanks, thanks Jeffrey. <clears throat> I'd like to turn to uh, Joanna Bergman and uh, Wendy Wasserman, um, they who have managed to split uh, the topic for Northwell they managed to split um, other um, webinars. Um, I'm not so sure that they, I, I know the dividing line. I know they, they do themselves. Joanna is a, a grad uh, of uh, Boston University and has her MPH. Uh, Wendy is a grad of George Washington Law School. Um, and uh, Jeffrey mentioned the, the governor's proposed legislation, which was proposed as part of the budget. And um, I'm not going to go through all of it, but the way they described it in the budget briefing book is, is more than a little misleading because it talks about such things as unlicensed staff and uh, obsolete location requirements and uh, reimbursement for patient monitoring, et cetera, et cetera. But I have 
discovered um, in looking at uh, different things that that maybe is only half of the topics that ought to be addressed. And uh, maybe as uh, you might, Joanna might lead off and talk a little bit about uh, the, the underpinnings of uh, telehealth that we, we have in the state, uh, what had been relaxed, um, God knows when the executive orders are gonna continue uh, and, or whether the power for the governor to make them will continue, what happens if they end suddenly. And then there's, uh, as Dr. Dorfler pointed out the other day, for all that um, uh, the head of CMS had, had, had promoted telehealth and the current nominee for HHS has spoken favor of, of it uh, just recently in his, in his uh, um, confirmation hearings, you still need some change in federal law because things suspended uh, are only good for during the pandemic. So Joanna, with that a complicated an introduction, I know you can handle uh, all of this. And Wendy, when you um, get the ball passed to you, congratulations. <laughs> cool, thank you so much. And thanks for uh, inviting us to be here today. Um, we don't have this at all formally sort of organized. So we'll just kind of pass it back and forth and, and address things as they come up. I mean, I think that, um, you know, Wendy and I have been supporting Dr. Dorfler and the telehealth team at, at Northwell for a while and certainly pre-COVID, I'd say probably 15 or 20% of our time. Um, and, and obviously at about the same time Jeffrey was going virtual, you know, our, our, our workload in the telehealth space exploded um, and the same, you know, just to sort of provide the support that the group needed to be able to expand in the way that it did within the time frame that it, that it had to do that. Um, and I think that we were very, very glad to have had the, the, the runway. Um, so we had a lot of kind of existing knowledge and information about how the, how the regulatory sort of framework worked and, and sort of could, you know, quickly understand um, the, the impact of a lot of the changes that, that were being put into place in response to the demand for, um, you know, the, the telehealth services, um, so that we could we could meet those needs and 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 implement those regulations pretty quickly. Um, it was definitely a heavy lift, and it's something that we're still working on. And and I think the big challenge for us, and and we can talk about some of the specifics, but the big challenge, at least from a from a legal perspective, is, you know, we're seeing all these relaxed rules. That Jeffrey was talking about, we'll talk about some of those, but they, you know, the whole platform is really uncertain. All of the things that are happening in a very temporary kind of um, uh, way, um, obviously in anticipation that the that the pandemic and the public health emergency will expire at some point, and and that would of course be welcome news. But with that, we worry that a lot of these relaxations and flexibilities will contemporaneously lapse and and sort of what do we do and how do we build a build a business around you know all of these new new opportunities and and, and you know fingers crossed that it'll stay in place so it's it's definitely been an interesting journey kind of with that big picture in mind sort of having no idea where kind of where this will end um, but certainly welcome the opportunity to try to sort of push it in in, in certain ways so um, again, I think from a regulatory perspective, um, you know, the, the, the federal rules and state rules all that are relevant to our sort of discussion all go to sort of who can provide telehealth services, who can receive telehealth services, how those telehealth services can be provided, including the modalities that are available, as well as um, kind of where, where they can be provided, sort of geographical considerations or, or otherwise. Um, as, as we've talked about, there's federal aspect. Medicare has some some thoughts on it, um, as does state state Medicaid. There are also state licensure issues, and as Jeffrey was talking about, as Wendy can talk about more, some of our the sort of regulatory frameworks that are around mental health and behavioral health um, are their own little niche and sort of subset of rules that have also been changed, um, at least temporarily, for now. Um, so we can talk about some of those and and sort of. I don't know if folks have questions. I'd be eager to hear about, you know, from from the others on the panel, kind of which of these um, changes have been sort of most beneficial and most effective. Um, I know there are a few that we all sort of hope and dream will will stay in place, but um, I will just sort of start to run through some of these, um, and then we can sort of see where we go. Um, so pre-pandemic, you know, there were rules about who could provide. Uh, 
telehealth services, Medicare had rules, Medicaid had rules. I, we've seen across the board an expansion of, of, of who could do it. Um, in Medicare in particular added a, a small handful of providers, physical therapists, occupational therapists, speech language pathologists to their somewhat you know modest list and, and Medicaid sort of just, just opened the door wide and, and basically um, expanded an already pretty large list to include any you know eligible Medicaid provider could could provide telehealth services, um, all of which you know to the extent consistent with their uh, scope of practice. Um, another related rule about sort of who could receive um, which sort of patients were eligible to receive telehealth services um, has seen some changes um, that I think were welcome uh, among our group, which was um, the existing uh, the pre-existing patient role, which Medicare had a role that uh, you know, approved provider types could only provide telehealth to their to their patients to the extent they were pre-existing. You, you couldn't establish a new patient via via telehealth. And we saw in the CARES Act um, as a result of the the public health emergency a removal of this pre-existing patient requirement for purposes of and the duration of the pandemic. Um, Wendy, do you want to talk maybe a little bit about OMH and OASAS? Sure. So um, prior to the pandemic, and Jeffrey absolutely alluded to this earlier, um, under the jurisdiction of OMH, a limited set of provider types could provide services to patients. However, during the pandemic, um, the scope of services has been expanded to include any professional, power, paraprofessional, or unlicensed behavioral health staff. Um, additionally, um, prior to the pandemic, this is both on the OMH and OASIS front, before um, telehealth was used, OMH calls its telehealth version telemental health and OASIS calls its version of telehealth telepractice. Um, patients needed to receive uh, in-person appointments for providers to really determine whether telehealth was an appropriate modality of care for the specific patient. But during the pandemic, both OASIS and OMH have waived that initial face-to-face in-person requirement. Okay. All right, and then, so those were some sort of considerations about who can provide and who can receive under those frameworks. Um, I think another really important aspect, all of which again have been alluded to was sort of how the services can be performed. And, and by that, I mean sort of what sort of communications or technological modalities uh, would be available to support the, the care and, and, and just sort of be reimbursable, right? I mean, all of this is a question about sort of who can do what and, and, and what payers will pay for, um, which is obviously a, a, an important component of it. And what we saw across the board again was, was an expansion of modalities, m most notably going from sort of a two-way real-time interactive communication uh, to, to being able to use um, technologies that were capable of, of that, but not necessarily, you know, deploying that. And, and another thing that we saw was the, the addition of telephone as an approved modality um, to a limited degree under Medicare and, and, and to quite an expansive degree under Medicaid, uh, so much so that, um, and Wendy, you can correct me, but I think uh, New York Medicaid has, has actually made that addition permanent um, so that telephone now becomes a, a permitted modality uh, for, for telehealth services that are otherwise reimbursable under Medicaid. Um, I want to talk a little bit about HIPAA, um, but Wendy, do you want to talk about to the OMH and OASAS component of that before kind of getting to that? Um, I think what Joanna just said applies to both OASIS and OMH. Um, Pre-pandemic, um, two-way audiovisual HIPAA compliant technology needed to be used, but now telehealth, I'm sorry, telephone and other modalities are appropriate. Um, one thing that I wanted to mention is that um, the Office of Civil Rights during the pandemic have basically uh, exercised enforcement discretion, which basically says if HIPAA compliant apps are not used, um, <laughs> they're not going to basically prosecute it. 
but uh, certain technologies like, like um, TikTok or Facebook Live are not approved for use. Um, but one thing that I wanted to say is mental health really um, gets another level of scrutiny. So although the federal government um, has said that it will exercise enforcement discretion, um, when services are provided via telepractice and telemental health, if possible, HIPAA compliant technology should absolutely be used. Um, and OASIS, um, in addition to HIPAA compliant technology, really would like its um, technology to be compliant with part two, which is uh, additional stringent regulations to treat patients with substance use disorder. Yeah, and I think I think that um, the sort of OCR maneuver was interesting and one that we struggled with and I think continue to struggle with. I mean, I think, again, just sort of reiterating what others have said is that, you know, we all found ourselves having to do everything remotely. And so you're using whatever sort of tools you have. And I think it, it made a lot of sense to, to facilitate that, um, you know, as much as possible, and 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 not sort of, and and we sort of welcomed OCR's statements, um, OCR although didn't totally. Means what? OCR is the Office of Civil, oh, what is it, Civil Rights? Yes. Um, they they uh, enforce HIPAA, uh, and so HIPAA, which is our privacy, the health insurance, portability, and no health insurance, it's only health information. <laughs> It was only OCR that I wanted people to know what it meant. <laughs> Good, because I can't remember what HIPAA stands for. Um, yeah, Office of Civil Rights enforces HIPAA, and they they issued um, just a notice, which is available on their website um, early on in the pandemic. That that, as Wendy said, sort of announced their their um, intention not to um, enforce, um, uh, the, you know, or not to. Uh, prosecute people if they use technologies that are not HIPAA compliant. HIPAA compliant technologies is a requirement across the board for for um, these kinds of exchanges. And it was it was uh, I didn't expect anything like that. And again, we didn't totally know what to do with it because it made us all very nervous. Um, so Joanne, let me just jump in real yeah. quick because that was all <laughs> triggered by the former president standing at the dais and saying everyone should use FaceTime, which is not HIPAA compliant. Got it. And even OCR and CMS didn't intend to do that. And just as you had to, and we all had to react to that, it was all simply a cascading reaction to an off the cuff comment um, that wasn't at all intended to do what it did. Excellent, I did not know that, thank you. <laughs> well, it put us all in a pickle. Especially because prior to that, OCR had been very uh, vigilant and aggressive in regard to uh, applying HIPAA penalties. Let me let me kind of say uh, that you have all laid out some of the wonderful mix of things that have taken place. Um, and as some of the uh, emergence, the time for the emergency to end, whether it be um, during this year or next year, um, I would ask which of all of the different um, new uh, procedures of relaxed rules, et cetera, which of the ones that you that affect you the most would you say ought to be retained? Um, and let me start off with you, Martin. Um, just where would you point us to? Well, let, let me start off by saying I am not an anti-regulatory guy um, and, because I'm going to sound like one. Um, healthcare uh, is an incredibly important component of people's lives, the economy, uh, and an awful lot of things need to be done right in order to make sure that it is delivered in an effective, efficient way um, to the best of our ability to the populations we serve. That said, um, having two outstanding lawyers having to spend 20% of their time, um, even pre-COVID, helping us be prepared for this kind of thing and all the work that Joanna and Wendy and some of their team have had to do while we're going through all of this says that this whole situation is too complex. And the biggest thing that we need is actually a level playing field. I can't, you know, I, I, I do not, I can't run a practice. I don't run a practice, but I have a lot of people who do. I can't run a practice where a patient with Medicare is treated differently than a patient with Medicaid is treated differently than a patient with private insurance 
et cetera. I need to be able to run my practice taking care of a patient with pneumonia as a patient with pneumonia as a patient with pneumonia, et cetera. And Jeffrey you know, has to do the same thing. So the biggest thing that we need is, is, is an across the board, patients are patients and whoever their payer is, are there regulations that, were, that are applied to us? And there are some special things about the mental health space. So I don't wanna discount that. And there are some special things around children. You know, there are special populations here where there, it, that do indeed warrant some degree of regulatory differences compared to the broader population. But on, on par, children are children from a, from a how I wanna practice with them. I don't wanna differentiate one child from another one by the kind of insurance their parents have. Um, and we also need to be looking at the availability of, of the technology. Uh, we need the technology companies to come into play and make sure that 5G is distributed uh, broadly. We do have people pay, paying attention to now broad Wi-Fi. But you know, to the direct answer to your question, the big thing that I need to see is the payment reform things that were put into place made permanent, particularly at the federal level, because the state can only do so much. It's not the major player here in that space. Um, and, and even there, within the state level, to see payment reform have an office visit be equivalent to a virtual visit. If I see a patient, the you know, Jeffrey situation in particular, I'll, I'll change it into a neurology visit. I see a patient with a movement disorder and I can evaluate whether or not they're getting better or worse with the medication that I put them on by spending 15 or 20 or 30 minutes or whatever it is in this visit. I shouldn't get paid less because I didn't require that patient to come into my office. Because if you're gonna pay me more to have them come into my office, I'm gonna have them come into my office. I mean, I can't run the business differently. So those are to me, the most important pieces that have to, to stick with this is, is the payment reform so that a patient is a patient is a patient from the standpoint of, of how the provider community gets paid for the services they provide. Jeffrey, I wondered, I'd always, I'd always wondered about the um, restrictions on visits for 15 minutes, 30 minutes, and then sometimes prohibitions on having two visits in one day, even though it made the most um, uh, sense in delivering uh, the, the counseling. So what would you uh, say we should uh, point to as keeping, keeping what's been relaxed? Uh, yeah, I mean, I echo a lot of the points that just been made. I think that for, for us, it's really important in terms of to have, as, as, as you said, Marty, the, the level playing field in terms of, you know, at one point, Medicaid was uh, allowing, uh, you know, uh, video and audio tele, uh, telehealth, but Medicare was only allowing video. And so they changed that kind of, you know, uh, mid pandemic in terms of you can, you can uh, audio was okay. For the folks that we deal with, many of the folks are very, very disabled. And uh, we need to be able to treat them all kind of equally and be able to use the tools in our toolbox that will allow us to you know, treat the person to get the best kind of outcomes. And uh, by, you know, in, in addition, by having not only licensed people work with those folks, but paraprofessionals, such as peers. Peers are so important in terms of when, when folks have a substance abuse disorder and someone who's gone through that can work with them to kind of open that door to recovery, um, we should be able to get paid for that. Um, and that's, uh, that's, that's really important. So those are the kinds of things I'd like to see, you know, become permanent. I know I've known a couple of mental health professionals who given, given up their relationship with um, healthcare payers, insurance companies, because, uh, and they've gone strictly uh, on their own um, because they were so fed up with the amount of reporting that they had to make to the insurance companies. Um, have they relax that also during the pandemic? Somewhat, yeah, somewhat. I, I, I'd like to see, you know, just, just a digress a, a moment. And, and Kemp, you, you mentioned a couple of things. We're a certified community behavioral health center, you know, and that allows us when someone comes in, we get one rate for that. So whether we provide one service or whether we provide 10 services for that day, that rate is covered for that. And um, there are hundreds of clinics across uh, you know, the country that are becoming uh, certified behavioral health clinics. And it's becoming a movement because we've seen better health outcomes with that. And it gives us flexibility to do a whole lot of things that we wouldn't uh, normally allowed to do. And um, 
you know, insurance companies will see the outcomes with patients are much better and it's more cost efficient. And that's where we're hoping kind of the, the movement kind of goes and insurance companies kind of get on board with that. And I really do think they will very soon. Wendy, you've had to deal with the OMH or OASIS uh, regs. In fact, they just came out with some new regs of, of, about a week ago. Um, are they moving in the right direction uh, or, are they, or are they, you feel they might be uh, just have their finger on the button to go back to where we were? So I don't know, but um, in regards to the guidance that came out a couple of weeks ago, uh, there is some, I would say, progression in um, allowing providers who are able to provide telehealth during the pandemic to continue to do so if they work under the jurisdiction of OMH. So prior to the pandemic, in order for a provider to provide services to OMH, they needed to uh, you know, fall under OMH's licensure, which means that um, a provider in a private practice is not, does not fall under OMH's jurisdiction. That provider would fall under GOH's jurisdiction. So for a provider um, prior to the pandemic to provide uh, telemental health services under the jurisdiction of OMH, they would have to submit a whole plan to OMH that would have to be approved. But during the pandemic, what happened is if you didn't have approval by OMH, you would just sign an attestation and then you could provide the services. Post-pandemic, we don't know what will happen, but OMH is giving providers the opportunity to submit an abbreviated application to OMH to continue the services that the providers are currently performing, which is some uh, progress. Hopefully that's a, a good transition that they're, they're pointing to the future. Joanna, um, part of the, the practice of physical medicine is, is the testing that's involved uh, for the benefit of the provider. Um, blood tests, urine tests, um, whatever. Yet you can't do that um, in regard to purely telehealth. Is there any process or are you taking any steps to figure out the regulations uh, that might be uh, needed to be addressed and the steps that need to be addressed to kind of uh, merge together the, the, the telehealth office visit and the practical things of getting different tests? Gosh, I don't know the answer to that question. Um, I maybe I'm looking yeah, at yeah, Dr. Garfler and I'm wondering can, if he has some thoughts. <laughs> yeah, I can jump in and help you with that one, Joanne, on two fronts. One, you know, Kemp, a lot of times when you go to your doctor's office, uh, they don't actually draw your blood right in the office. They'll send you to a, another location potentially in the same building or other to get labs. And so you can order labs. Um, they're actually, you know, coming, coming to, there are companies out there. We do this in some of the skilled nursing facilities that will do a stretch, do a, do a chest X-ray for a patient who's in, in a facility. Um, and you know, not to plug Northwell on this, we actually pushed out a product we'll called LabFly, uh, which is, you know, for I think it's 10 or 15 bucks, we'll actually send a phlebotomist to a patient's home. And certainly during the COVID, uh, during the, the spring crisis, um, things like that. And there are, there are other commercial entities that are doing some of the same things. During the spring crisis, I even had some physicians you know, specifically call me up and say, I saw a patient, they needed some labs. I then sent a phlebotomist to their home who drew their labs. I got the results back later that day. Coming back to Jeff's point, I then had another visit with the patient later in the same day and followed up with them on their lab test. And I ordered medications from the CVS down the street from them, uh, which they may have gone down together. The CVS may have had them delivered to their homes. And so the, the collection of things that are going on in the broader community, um, there are things that can't be done. I mean, you can't really uh, do, you, you can't do screening, you know, colonoscopy on telehealth. I mean, just as a, a sort of a ridiculous example to put out there, but there are things you can't do, but the basics um, can be done. When you get a CT scan done because you've, uh, you've, you've got, you know, a swollen left ankle, um, they're not doing that in the doctor's office. They're sending you to an imaging center to do that anyway. And so seeing that patient determining they need a CT scan or a regular x-ray of their ankle doesn't change anything, whether you saw them in your office or you saw them in their home uh, with good technology to allow you to do the appropriate evaluation. Well, that being said, you talk about your example of the phlebotomist. 
<clears throat> Northwell has a pretty extensive, uh, sophisticated um, home home ambulatory medical services, and I'm just wondering if there's a, that that your physicians were able to integrate what they were doing with the home services during the pandemic. Yeah, it, it, there was one. We were we were really lucky. The second week, uh, was actually the third week of March, um, all of our home care nurses already had tough books uh, for their use because they go into the home and they do their documentation and the like. And all of them already had video cameras in them and, and such. So we brought the entire home care team up onto our telehealth platform literally in four days. And they converted themselves uh, for at least the, the spring crisis 100% into um, their virtual space. The other thing that we've been working on over the last couple of years is, is with waivers from the state. And again, Wendy and Joanna have been part of this and they may comment on what our waivers were as we created a community paramedicine program. Uh, Northwell has its own uh, CEMS, Center for Emergency Medical Services, with paramedics. And a paramedic is not normally allowed to go to a home to treat a patient. They're supposed to go ho to that home, pick them up and bring them to the hospital. We had put in place this program under pilot with telehealth support to those uh, paramedics. And that was expanded during the crisis as well in particular, so that we could send a paramedic out to somebody and they could actually administer therapy. They could give them a nebulizer, they could give them a dose of medication, they could hang a bag of fluid and things along that, and have home care come in the next day and follow on them and potentially keep them out of the hospital if they were not sick enough that they had to be there. We actually stood up a whole COVID at home program for patients who uh, were sick, but, but we could keep out of the hospital with regular follow-up and home oxygen and a pulse oximeter and things along that line. So the number of things that were done during the spring crisis that built upon pilot programs that were there, some of them with waivers, all of which then the waivers became at least temporarily allowed, all of which we hope will, will be sustained uh, in the long run, uh, it really was pretty, pretty amazing um, and resulted in an awful lot of better care to the communities we serve than we would have been able to do if those, if those things weren't available to us. Well, two, two questions. One to Joanna, would you tell us a little bit about that waiver? Because I know there are people who are who made proposals to do that and don't know that there's a waiver possible. And, and then second, um, in regard to that home care, are you now going to, uh, Dr. Dorfler, integrate that with telehealth and televisits for the physician? You first, Joanna. Okay, well, I would, one thing I wanted to say just sort of related to that, and then we'll sort of get to, to the question. Um, one of the things that I think I thought of when you were asking about, um, ordering things and, and testing and stuff like that was something that we've been running into. And I, we, we, I just wanted to touch on it, um, which is the state licensure question and, and just this notion that we've been running into that some of the waivers that have been really animating our ability to continue to provide care to our patients are those state licensure waivers that have kind of been happening all across the country that will allow people who, uh, providers who are not licensed in the state um, to, to provide telehealth services to, to their patients. Um, the general rule uh, is, you, you know, you're practicing where your patient is just sort of dictates you know, so where, where you're practicing, where, you're, where, where you need to be licensed to practice. So if, if your patient if usually comes to see you in New York, but lives in New Jersey and then wants to have a telehealth visit with you while they're in New Jersey, the provider should be licensed in New Jersey to do that. Um, and so what we saw throughout, throughout the pandemic are, were waivers of those laws that would really facilitate that cross cross-border care. Um, those are starting to lapse, um, but but that has been instrumental in sort of allowing us to continue to do what we were doing. Um, but it did sort of trip us up sometimes if you know you had to order a test or order a lab, could could that same doctor continue to do that? And you know, there were some things they could do just sort of virtually and other things that they had to kind of jump like you know order and, and did they have the privileges to do that. Um, so I just wanted to sort of throw that out there before we we let that one go. Um, I'm gonna, I, I don't know that I know the waiver that we're talking about for-, can, for um, can I actually- yeah, was gonna talk uh, about it. <laughs> So this I actually just wanted to- we share a brain. <laughs> so I actually just wanted to piggyback uh, yeah. off of something that Joanna said and then something that Dr. Dorfler said. So uh, in the governor's, so Joanna talked about licensure and in order to provide services, a provider needs to be licensed in the state where the patient is located, absent um, some other exception, um, in his state of state, the governor did mention that he is tasking the state education department with coming up with um, an interstate licensure compact with some states in the Northeast 
Um, we will hear more about that probably in 2022. Um, we don't necessarily think that the state education department is the right, uh, the right party to, to do that. It, this might be better served if the Department of Health took that under, but um, more to come in the future. And um, Dr. Dorfler did describe the community paramedicine program, but another thing that happened during the pandemic, which has also been piloted, is involuntary commitment from the community. So pre-pandemic, um, in order to involuntarily commit someone, the prov a provider needed to see the patient in person. And if the, like, the provider could have a consult with a via telehealth with a psychiatrist, but um, the provider physically present with the patient needed to sign um, the commitment papers. During the pandemic, uh, somebody can be committed via telepsychiatry. So that's, I think, and Jeff, if you could speak to this, that has probably been uh, helpful um, for the community. And it would be great if, if that could be retained post pandemic. Jeff? Yeah, no, Wendy, I, I, I agree with you. That was always a challenge uh, uh, for us. And now this has opened up a, a lot of avenues in terms of to, to get somebody who needs help, uh, the help they need. So uh, I agree, uh, that would be very uh, instrumental. And you don't know who, where the waiver came from? Which waiver was it? <laughs> the, 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 under what authority were we doing the community paramedicine program? It's been in place for a number of years. And uh, I think it almost came before the. the it was it, it was pre-pandemic. It was yeah. specifically a pilot program. Um, I'm sure DOH signed off on it, but I'm not close enough to it to know uh, mm -hmm. what was actually involved in, in getting that sign off. Yeah, mm -hmm. it was some I think DOH FDNY type of pilot. Um, well, the FDNY pilot is actually I know people had proposed legislation to do just that, and they were not able to get it to move forward. And yeah, uh, I know you're, you're right, Kemp. The legislation didn't happen, but but I think that part of what their people were looking at is can they do pilots like this to potentially inform further legislation? And that might be yeah. one of the things farther down the line. We could get our emergency medicine folks into that conversation if we need to. But we we have been doing a community paramedicine pilot. We actually had some grant money from Verizon originally help support that, but it's several years in, in place and has some degree of publication uh, pre-COVID and during COVID obviously became even more valuable. Well, it's good to know. Let me, uh, we have been having a wonderful discussion and uh, the depth of your knowledge is incredible. So, but my thought would be somewhat in reverse order is to go to each of you and say, what would you be your your final thoughts you'd want to leave those in the audience and those who watch this in the future. What would be your final thoughts uh, in regard to telehealth or telemedicine? Um, I had not appreciated Wendy until you pointed out that they, they were both used uh, by different agencies of the state. Um, an, il an illustration of some of the problems of the regulatory powers of the state. But maybe you could tell us a little bit about what would you like to leave uh, our audience with as thoughts on telehealth? Um, Wendy, I'll start with you. Sure, so I think um, different branches of the government. So the federal legislation is very different than the state legislation pre-pandemic. The federal legislation was very restrictive. Um, telehealth could only be provided to a Medicare beneficiary. For example, if the beneficiary was located in a rural area in a specified type of facility during the pandemic, the geography uh, requirements as well as the patient's physical location were waived. Um, in New York State has a lot of flexibility as to who could provide the service and where the patient could be located under the jurisdiction of DOH. OMH and OASIS are a little bit more restrictive than DOH. It would really be great 
and I don't know that this will ever happen, but it would be great if the federal regs could align with the state regs and that the state agencies could all come to a very similar understanding as to how things should be. So it would be great if OMH, DOH, OASIS and OPWDD, for example, allowed or followed the same practice in regard to telehealth because pre-pandemic, each agency had its own regulations which is with its own allowances. And something, for example, could be allowed by OASIS, but not OMH. Um, so it would just be great to just see all of the regulations from the different agencies align. Great stuff. Jeffrey, you're next on my screen. <laughs> excellent, excellent. One thing that we didn't comment on is, you know, how telehealth is going to reduce stigma for some folks. So, you know, I, I think that's going to allow more access to care. Um, you know, for someone to come to a clinic like ours is a really big step. And some folks uh, had a lot of feelings about walking through the door, coming to a place like ours and sitting in a waiting room and looking around and maybe not relating to some of the other people that are there. To be able to be in your home and get help and treatment um, on demand is going to you know, increase access and increase people who are normally really fearful of reaching out for help. And now all of a sudden they're going to start doing that. And uh, it is the hope that as we you know, expand telehealth and we you know, kind of uh, put these uh, new regulations into place that more people are going to find it acceptable to reach out and, and get the treatment they need. And that's what I'm most excited about. I hadn't thought about that at all. And, and are the, your patients reacting positively to the ability to do this? Uh, most are, uh, you know, most are really excited in terms of to be able to, uh, you know, when you're at home, you're most comfortable. So they're uh, able to deal with some issues that they may not have been able to dealt with, uh, you know, at the office because they're, there's a, there's a, they're feeling more comfortable. Um, there are still some that like to come to the office. And that's why I think, you know, when the, when the pandemic ends, hopefully one day, you know, we'll have a hybrid model of people who need to be seen in the office. That's okay. And they're high risk and we would see them, but people who are comfortable being seen at home. We can certainly, uh, you know, accommodate that and do that. Does it add to the counseling that they've seen a provider in person? I think it does, uh, you know, in terms of, you know, initially uh, we have found that it, it's really helpful to establish that relationship and then to move on to virtual. Um, and, and we've moved on to, you know, uh, once you have that relationship, someone's really comfortable in that virtual realm for the most part we've seen. Okay. Jo Joanna, thought that you'd like to leave with the audience? I think, you know, professionally, I would echo Wendy's point. It would be wonderful to see things aligned. Um, I, I don't know um, how easy that's going to be. Um, I, I think my sort of parting thoughts are more sort of anxiety driven and sort of what it's all going to look like as it starts to unwind and then build back up again. So I guess I'm hopeful for some patience and some time, but I do think that this is going to be an important element of, of care kind of going forward. And so I'm sort of excited to see how it all sort of evolves. I think we've, we've got attention and got momentum. So hopefully we can retain that, do some good stuff. Great. And Dr. Dorfler, thoughts? That yeah, you I think the thought that I want to leave people with is, is disparities. Um, the history of telehealth for the last number of decades has constantly raised the issue of underserved rural communities. And they exist and they need to have support. Um, but there are a lot of underserved urban communities. Um, and there are racial disparities that are particularly in place in underserved rural communities, which I believe has been part of the distinction that has resulted in them remaining underserved. And as we move forward with this, I think it's really important that the focus on expansion makes sure that it includes everyone um, and that we equate underserved communities broadly uh, as needing special attention, regardless of whether or not they are rural or urban. Thank you, uh, and, and a good point. And, and 
There are places in the state, rural and urban, that don't have good internet service, believe it or not. And that then it goes to whether or not some families have a good uh, uh, computer or mobile phone or anything to get that service. So um, interesting stuff. You've set great challenges uh, out there. You've gained a great informed discussion as to uh, what telehealth and telemedicine is all about. Uh, your expertise is, is just self-evident. And I thank you very much for all of the time you've spent with us this afternoon. And I thank everybody in the audience uh, for your great attention. And with that, I thank you very much. We'll draw, the, draw this webinar to a close. Thank you. <laughs>